Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, April 19th, happy birthday, Danica, 2018. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello, everyone. I didn't realize it was a cue was on me. It's an early morning this morning, but hi, welcome to the podcast. I'm Norm, joined by Jeremy Williams. Oh, hi, Norman Chan. And Kishore Hari. Hello. I think we're all out of it today. <clears throat> it's, it's a weird morning. We're actually recording this two days before this podcast being released because, Kishore, you're leaving town. I am heading to New York for a few days. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going mostly for meetings, but I'm going to get to go to the Tribeca Film Festival. You're going to the tri- you're going to Tribeca. I'm going to see the premiere of a of a science documentary called The Serengeti Rules. It's about the scientist John B. Carroll's uh, adventures. Whoa! There, but um, I'm excited to check out a couple other things. I know the Thirty for Thirty, which I love that series, is doing a panel. On that sounds like a sports something. thing. It is a sports thing. Mm. And then. Um, there's a couple films I want to check out. I haven't checked the schedule. There's a Gilda Radner documentary uh, that looks really great. And then there's a documentary called The Fourth Estate, which is a behind-the-scenes look at the New York Times over the past couple years, which has been kind of tumultuous both internally at the Times, plus there's been a lot of news breaking. So hmm. I like the idea of going into kind of their war room and seeing how the news gets made. Have you ever been there before, Tribeca? I haven't before. I'm sort of – I'm excited to, to – Check it's it a out. big yeah. deal. I mean, we have a film festival here, the SF International Film Festival, and it lasts uh, several weeks. And but it's and there are events around it. But New York, it's massive. Like ads everywhere for it. Big things get shown there. Yeah, I need recommendations for food. I'm going to what? New York. I gotta eat some good food. There's I know plenty I'm of good food. You watch no, no. New? I'm I'm not saying I can't find good food. I need okay. recommendations for new places. Mm, what what type of foods are uh, would you solicit recommendations about? I'm looking for anything that's a little bit ethnic and weird. A little bit ethnic and weird. All yeah. right. There you go, listeners out there. Send your recommendations to at Science Quiche this week before he leaves for New York. So let's jump into our top story. Oh. Top story this week. Wow, I forgot we had the music cue. You know, that, that music cue sounds awfully a lot like the pinball music. No, you're right. It does. It sounds <clears throat> right. very... That's fair. I, I will add, there was a few complainants about our transition music length. Uh, we only use transition music that's been sent in yeah. by listeners. If you don't like the length, fix it. The length? The length. The length. Well, all right. Well, the top story this week, not a news story, but it's a recap of what went on this past weekend. This past weekend, I was at one of my favorite conventions of the year, Monster Palooza. In Pasadena, California. Why is it one of your favorite <coughs> conventions? Well, we've been to a bunch of pop culture conventions, and we do the pop culture convention circuit. You know, uh, we were at Silicon Valley Comic Con the week before. We were WonderCon even before that. We'll be at San Diego, and all those very standard. But we've talked about it on the podcast. Those conventions, while they're pockets of goodness and lots of fun to be had there, really the show floor ends up being a lot of your favorite toy store, comic book store. St- Pushed together with a lot of Funko, some mystery boxes. You might get yourself some Ready Player One coasters yep. there. I, I mean, you would say it's a lot of the same stuff. It's when a you lot go. of the same stuff. Uh, at Monster Palooza, it's very artist centric. All the exhibitors, a uh, vast majority of them are artists, uh, either with their small tables showing just some of their physical uh, uh, sculpting, uh, digital sculpting or physical sculpting, uh, selling resin kits, doing makeup demos. Uh, or uh, unveiling a big a new sculpture. Um, and so we're there for uh, two and a half days, and some of the tested team went down there. Sean Charlesworth drove down as well. Uh, Kate Sabaker was down there, and it was a really good time. Got, got to see a lot of cool stuff while videos rolling out. You actually, you should be finding some of those videos 
out there um, on the site this week. Any sort of standout things? Oh, my goodness. Um, So Prop Store was there uh, with items from their next uh, two auctions, three auctions, actually, um, one of which is Ghost in the Shell. So they had a lot of Ghost in the Shell props. The reboot. The reboot, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, well, well the, the, the live action. The live action Ghost in the Shell, exactly. Um, and then also a lot of armor from Warcraft, which was super cool to see. The Warcraft armor. Did it look good? It looked really good. Really? Because yeah. that movie, it didn't... I think the way the movie was, was sort of... Um, shown i didn't i wasn't super impressed because it looks it looks kind of like the game like the comically big armor i don't think big enough you know honestly no. for fans of the game the yeah. pauldrons could be bigger the boots could be bigger but i was talking to one of the reps there and you know it's a thing that we notice when we see costumes and you can tell it with like the ghost in the shell costume which is the, the thermoptic suit uh, actors are bigger on screen their personas are they're not only the personas but their physicality is bigger on screen with the way they're shot than they are in real life that's why people say when they see actors in person oftentimes smaller than they thought right shorter right uh, but the, the costumes for warcraft looked just as big in person as they did on screen because they were just oversized uh costumes why, why do you think comic-con is so much more commercial with all the toy stores out there is it because the venue wants to make more money that's i think that's it i think the, i mean these are private businesses right the, the organizers who put together these comic shows together when we're talking about 30 years ago 40 years ago comic book conventions were just like for the artists and for the fans. And then it became about for the publishers. And then they realized they had this event space where these people with some disposable income were paying to see stuff and to buy stuff. And so exhibit space started being sold to vendors. And vendors start small, and there's still plenty of small vendors at these shows, but the vendors with the most money mm-hmm. and the ones who can buy the most floor space and stuff, the most elaborate setups, are the really commercial vendors. So do you get the sense that Monster Palooza is actively resisting that? Yeah, I mean, it's already grown. When I started going, Frank invited us uh, four years ago, I think, um, to go, and it was at the Marriott, like, in-hotel convention center no. next to the Burbank Airport. Small, but mm-hmm. still outgrowing that. Now it's at the Pasadena Convention Center, and the lines outside, I felt bad because like the, people bought tickets. They showed up to buy tickets. You could buy them beforehand, but they showed them. The line outside must have been at least 2,000 people what? in the sun, wearing black, of course. <laughs> um, and they turned away a ton, ton of people. Oh, really? Yeah, like people were <laughs> waiting up until 5 o'clock um, to, to try to get in to buy tickets. There was, a, I mean, this has become like, celebrities go to this like will wheaton and chris hardwick were there there's well it's, it's i mean there's a lot of like your favorite actors from b movies or uh classic horror movies like uh, and they're doing autographs they're doing autographs danny trejo is there uh fruza bulk so there's an element of that still there's like, a, yeah you're, totally. you're paying 15 bucks for an autograph to these people more like yeah. 40 or 50 okay um but in the main hall um the the type of vendors that are there are people who on their day jobs may work at a uh, a big company, like a, like a video game company, like whether it's a Sony or Blizzard, or or even professional sculpting for like sideshow collectibles. But what they're there showing aren't isn't their professional work. They're showing their personal work. So they'll spend yeah. the month leading up to the show, hand casting a bunch of blank creatures, maybe painting them, and then selling just like two dozen of those at the show as the show special. And that's a lot of personal. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of work to show off their personal stuff. And the stuff is there a really, rush to really get good. in quickly so that you oh, can yeah. get dibs on some of the that lines? Stuff? I mean, it, it's like a late show. Opens at eleven a.m., but the lines were there at like nine or eight a.m. and it was real tough to get in. Like you're just waiting outside for a long time. Did you buy anything? I did. I bought a few kits. Um, I saw um, uh, Dominic Quick, who uh, used to be a Blizzard artist. Uh, he we've done some medium sculpting with him. Uh, Oculus Medium Sculpting, and he uh, he had some uh, skull kits. I bought a nice new one. Um, I chatted with uh, some people who like work in 3D printing to make molds and then uh, to prototype collectibles and then send those off to be manufactured. Uh, Oculus Medium was also there. It's a big show for them because they're trying to get artists interested in their VR sculpting tools. Did they have a booth? They did. They wow. had a booth, and they had a ton of 3D prints, and I chatted with one of their artists. Um and, uh, you know, it's, it's an international show, so a lot of um, international artists there as well. Um, some movie companies, uh, uh, people who work for, do behind-the-scenes work. So Ironhead Studio, we've seen there a couple of times. They're the people who do specialty costumes for uh, movies like um, 
Batman v Superman, and they did uh, what's the most recent one? They did uh, they did some altered carbon armor, and we talked chat about that. Their founder Jose Fernandez designed the costumes for uh, X Men Two, and so they had Wolverine's costume from X Men Two, and I chatted with him about that design. Um, and then there's a new uh, costume company that I met up with, um, Quantum Creations Effects, and they made all the costumes for Watchmen, uh, the Zack Snyder film, and they also had a really cool Fallout Pip Boy that they made for Bethesda for a TV commercial, hmm. and um, and then they also made some hand props for a new Ghostbusters film. So a lot of cool stuff. The videos will all be out in a bit, um, but it was a really really fun time. Our favorite hot sauce maker is a liar. <gasps> He's a whoa, 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 officially whoa, whoa, whoa. a cheater. How, how how could you speak to me and, and how could you speak for us about our favorite hot sauce maker? <laughs> I've never even tried this hot sauce, dude. I actually yeah. tried. <laughs> how was it? <laughs> it's okay. Billy Mitchell outed as a cheat. Well, uh, the, the outing happened a while ago, right? The, the well the, proven. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, Billy Mitchell, for anyone who has not seen the documentary King of Kong: Fistful of quarters uh was a uh, gamer video game player of the century uh first person to play a perfect game of pac-man mm-hmm. uh, and a holder of many world records according to twin galaxies the records holder uh, part of that uh c- competitive uh, the cl- uh, first generation of competitive video gamers uh, way back in the 80s and um at some point held uh, was the first person to pass a million points in Donkey Kong and held that world record for a very long time. Uh, well, that was this part of the story of this documentary, The King of Kong. Right, where uh, school teacher Steve Wiebe, uh, in his garage, learned Donkey Kong and used mathematics uh, to beat that high score. Well, Billy Mitchell, who was played as portrayed as the villain in that documentary, and he's also a character in um, the, what's the Nibbler documentary? Yep. Uh, right. Snake. Snake. Uh, no, it's, it's called, what's it called? The video game is Nibbler. I, right. There's a documentary about the greatest Nibbler players. Right, right. He's a character <laughs> in, in that as well. He's kind of a guru. Yeah. Well, no, no. Walter Day is the guru. He's a, well, he's a mentor? He's a, he's, he's a, <laughs> Wait, he's, he's a, a towering figure. Yeah. But he's called upon for inspiration and level-headedness. Man I, I, versus snake. Yeah. Uh, See, members, yeah. you're all down on him now. You can't say a positive thing I about can't. Billy Mitchell. I can't. No, <laughs> no. Out as a cheater. And, 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 you know, there had been some, uh, he'd c- contested his portrayal in King of Kong and said that was exaggerated. And I, d- I think I definitely think in terms of making the documentary, they positioned him in, in a role. But that positioning was accurate because several weeks ago, it was unveiled via screen caps of his video submission and frame by frame analysis mm-hmm. that he had perhaps used an emulator in his million point Donkey Kong run. Right. And this is because when the frame by frame analysis, they could tell that the way that the level refreshed was different on an emulator. And it was uh, clearly uh, using MAME on his video, um, different from how it would refresh on right. the actual <coughs> game board. Well, as, as important, this is important stuff. So let's get this fact straight here. Yeah. Okay. So Twin Galaxies has not said he used MAME. They said he did not use a, a unhacked board arcade board for right. Donkey Kong. That's all they could conclude. So the news this week is that Twin Galaxies has issued a ruling. Twin Galaxies is the is the book holders for yes. all the world records. Yes. Uh, and it is under new management, by the way. <gasps> Over the past couple of years, it is under new management. Walter Day is, Walter no, longer? Day is no longer running Oh, it. my goodness. So, oh, well, I mean, it was rife with corruption based off <laughs> recent stories, so this is reasonable. <laughs> Excuse me. So... Um, I don't. That's probably a factor. But in any case, the new management certainly wants to create a good name for Twin Galaxies and hold that good name. Sure. So they, they're doing everything they can. So they looked at the old tapes and they decided, sure enough, this is not authentic. They so they didn't just take away that high score. They struck that score, which it's not even a high score. It, it's on the leaderboard. Right. But it was uh, in history. It was recognized as the first million point right. score. And so he is no longer the first million point. No. Steve Achiever. Weeby. Steve Weeby has that now, but but all of Billy's scores have been stricken. That's the big thing. He is banned, banned from submitting scores at all to Twin Galaxies. Now he yeah. has come out with a statement himself, and yeah. he said he will. The facts will prove him right, and he will provide evidence 
still waiting for it. Um, this this whole new level of drama. What evidence could he possibly provide? I don't know. The only Character way witnesses. You got to sit there and play play the game right in front of everybody. That's the only way anyone's going to believe him now. And, and it doesn't matter because the hit, the the pass is is over. And he's like still going to gaming shows right now. I can't imagine what kind of reaction he's getting from people. Well, I'm sure it's it's divisive. I'm sure there are people who like him. Oh my gosh. And there are people who are who maybe would still consider him a friend and he they may, people may be forced to take two sides. <clears throat> the problem is he's actually a legitimately good player, but he screwed it all up. He messed up his whole legacy by cheating. You, by never, cheating. you never want to dope. <laughs> no, he you, you know he started out as a pinball. Cheaters never win. As a real pinball god. Like he was a Honest Didn't to God, he start off, wait, champion started pinball off player. as a pinball player before yeah. even Pac-Man. Oh yeah, now he wow. was he was well into pinball in that whole scene, and then video games came on the scene, and that took the spotlight. And so he said, "Well, that's where all the attention is, and I want the that." And so he became. Was it just persistence, or was it natural talent? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's certainly there's an element of ego involved too, and uh, competitiveness, yeah. determination, yeah. the will. To cheat and win, yeah, yeah, amazing. I mean, where I want some kind of sequel to King of Kong, even if it's a YouTube video, where where Steve Weeby, gets, Steve Weeby doesn't care anymore. Of course he does. No, he does. Of doesn't. course he does. They, he is a both of them have been man. long by per, long been surpassed by uh, new fans of Donkey Kong. Who, but he's had to live with this for for fifteen. No, it's years. like a little bit of vengeance. He had his vindication at the end of the documentary. When he had the high score for a little bit, <laughs> right? It was like a little text entry. Yeah, he was, he was playing the garage and he, he pumped up his his right hand, yeah, and, and he right. had six, a little bit of success. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I still am lamenting the fact that there is no King of Kong movie. That there was originally plans hmm? for a, a adaptation mean? of the documentary. Oh, you a, mean like a, a dramatization? A, a, yes, exactly. Um, to be uh, to to bring the awareness to even more mainstream audiences. And I think they kind of did that in the movie Pixels. Um, mm. it, that was the Adam Sandler movie. Uh, there, yeah. I think the executive producer of Pixels also was the guy who did King of Kong. He directed King of Kong. Um, but uh, in Pixels, Peter Dinklage, Tyrion from Game of Thrones, plays the Billy Mitchell character with the hair, the mullet, and everything. USA tie? Uh, no, I don't think he has a USA tie. America tie. It, it, USA is just his initials in the game. It, that scene is so perfect for a, a documentary, a, a mockumentary. So exactly, it feels at some point it feels like a mockumentary, and it's t- it, you got to dr- find out is this is there a line drawn between the fact and the fiction, or are these actually the real characters? I mean, I, I think they're perfect um, companions, uh, uh, or companions, um, King of Kong and also Man Marin versus Snake. Uh, yeah, I believe both of them are on Netflix. At least Man vs. Snake is on Netflix. Well worth watching. All right, on to other pop culture news. Uh, we have news of a new director for the Birds of Prey movie. Now, you guys may not be excited for a Birds of Prey movie, but I'm very for excited. For good reason. Why, why are you not excited? Because it's a DC thing. No oh boy. Well, it may not be part of their whole DC uh, shared you know, universe, and that whole thing is going under a revamp anyway. But this is the new Harley Quinn movie with, supposedly, theoretically, it will uh, be Poison Ivy and um, maybe another character. Uh, but a new director, um, it's a woman, and uh, her name is Kathy Yan, and she had previously released a movie at Sundance uh, that uh, was uh, widely acclaimed. Um, what was it called? Like Sick Pigs or something? Uh, something like that. Um, but uh, I'm glad that's moving forward. There's also the Batgirl movie, which Josh Whedon has stepped down from, and that's being moved forward with a, a new screenwriter. Oh, Dead Pigs. Dead Pigs, that's what it is. Why did Josh Whedon step down? No one knows. Many issues. Many. Yeah, there are issues. <laughs> Many <the> issues. issues. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I like them going with a, a, a kind of new, a little bit more unknown director. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like that's um, a good step forward for this. Plus... And um, especially in Batman the Animated Series, the the Harley Poison Ivy team ups were pretty fun. They're like upbeat, they're lighthearted, they're tonal want shift. Batman from... in this movie. Yeah, if we can avoid it, that'd be great. I I I, I have fun with them referencing it, but I think the movie the characters can stand alone without being just foils to the heroes. They have more personality than that. Hmm. Okay, but who's gonna stop them? They don't need to be stopped. Wow, 
anarchy over here. Yeah. The purge. Gotham. Uh, I think the cops can stop them. They'll be fine. They no. still have faith. No. Hey, it's the 30th anniversary of My Neighbor Totoro and also Grave of the Fireflies this week. Hmm. Yeah. How about that? Did you see uh, Totoro when they re-released some of the Miyazaki I movies? I did. Uh, was it a year ago? A year or two? Uh, I it was say only it was a few months ago. Well, they do it every year. Yeah. Uh, Miyazaki or Ghibli Fest um, with the, the AMC theaters. And I watched it with Will and his child. And um, it, it, was, it was very good. It's, it holds up. That movie totally holds up. So Totoro came out on the 20th anniversary of 2001. Oh. Yeah. 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 All right. Good facts. Um, did you guys watch Night Court? Heck yeah! Really? Yeah, I, I grew up. Ne- we, you, 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 We're you older than born, you, dude. It came. It was on at like eleven at night. Explain Night Court to me. Um, okay. Well, there's a, there's a courtroom, and that's that's basically where it takes place. And there's a judge, and there um, there's is a it, bailiff who yeah. is yeah. Judge Shooty. Are these bold? real cases? They, yeah. Well, no, they're not real cases. It's a oh, drama. Not. It's a comedy drama. Oh, this is a sitcom. Oh, you didn't okay. know about this? No. Okay. So no. yeah, it was on eleven o'clock at night. Was it like? No, it wasn't on at eleven o'clock. It was in the East Coast. It was super late. It was. It was part of like the NBC like Tuesday or Thursday lineup, but it yeah. was like on at like nine or nine thirty. Felt like eleven, and uh, it was a half hour show. Com- okay. It was funny. Had a, you know that, that good little theme song? Yeah. It was like, what would a court look like w- with the weird cases that come in late at night? Why would the cases come in late at night? Well, it's like a New why, York City. Why would they work so court late? That was open late. Yeah, Dude, why were they open late? I don't remember. Justice never sleeps, huh? They had a little a cast of funny characters, yes. and the judge was Harry Anderson. You had like the public defender, mm-hmm. John right. Larroquette, right? Yeah, and then why was there always? Oh the... no, he was the prosecutor. Oh, he was. Then who was yeah. the public defender? I can't remember her name. Oh, Marky Post. Wow. That was her name. Nice memory. So yeah, it's always like always the same cast, and oh. so the silly, silly, you know, cases would be brought. And then Do you think this was inspiration for Gary Widow's Nerd Court when he did ner- the Nerd Court? YouTube well, that, that's more of like a reality show, wasn't it? No, it was, I think it was scripted. Well, yeah, but it, I mean, wasn't it supposed to be? Supposed to look like it was real? I mean, it was. I think it was. I think it was filmed like a Judge Judy type show. Right, that's what I'm saying. Oh, so this was like a three camera setup. You this don't is get a- it. This is like Family Ties, but in a courtroom. But the whole thing was be set in a courtroom? <laughs> yes. Well, no, you went into his office Yeah. every now and then, but that, mm. that's about it. That's about it. Right. There was no outside. It was, it was the, the universe was the courtroom. Yeah. It was a yeah. good show. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. And Harry Anderson was pretty funny. Uh, Passed away yeah. last night. Well, it's it's news. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina. He was also an amateur magician of some renowned. <laughs> of some <laughs> renowned. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, RIP, Harry Anderson and... Uh, Watch yourself some Night Court. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will. Yeah, what were we watching? Um, what were we watching? Uh, a Larry Sanders show. Mm-hmm. And that's that's been yep. really good. Yeah. Um, more TV. Uh, Westworld. Hey, heads up, guys. Westworld season premiere Wait, this Sunday. I have an uh, important question about Westworld. Why is Simone at the Westworld premiere? I think she's doing something with Westworld. I think she alluded to such on on Twitter. What? Yeah. She, you know, Westworld is made of robots, and she interacts with, you know, shitty robots. I, I, am, I think there's going to be something, some tie-in. Maybe she might be in Westworld. I am stopped dead in my tracks. Yeah, there was Especially a Westworld Especially if she's in been, LA. like, a robot this whole time. I'm going to be no, very... No, the host the whole time? Yeah, she's what a, a host. What a twist. That would be quite the What's twist. What's a twist? No, I don't think so. The premiere comes out. The review's already out for the first couple episodes. Some people have watched No, screeners. thank you. How'd that happen? Uh, well, you know, they got to amp up anticipation. Uh, and the only thing I will say I've gleaned from, mm-hmm. uh, n- I didn't read plot details, but the only thing I've gleaned is that the, there's a new opener. There's a new opening credits. Different yeah. same song? Music, same music, okay. thankfully. Some, but slightly, I think different, different in terms of the imagery. I'm excited for did that. Did Game of Thrones change their intro? Yeah, they did. Well, they, whenever they introduce a new city, yeah, uh, they would have new it. locations. Um, and, and actually, even within one season, they would the in, uh, opening sequences would change oh. to focus on the cities and locations that the action would be taking place in that episode. Uh-huh. There's so be, much. I think it'd be great if this year the intro was just hosts murdering human beings okay. from the end. Of yeah. last in, year in slow shooting, motion, in, in black and white. Motion. You'd yeah. like to see that. Yeah. Uh, we talked about uh, Star Trek Discovery last week, and they're in production for season two. 
Uh, one of the things that was kind of spoilerish of the last season, the final sh- one of the final scenes in the first season was a direct connection to the original series. Now, do we want to talk about this direct connection? If we already have. We have? All right. Didn't we? All right. Didn't we? I, I believe we have. Yeah. So, too bad. It's not important to the whole plot of the show. It's more of a cameo appearance. But this first season ends with an appearance, just a very brief appearance yep. of the USS Enterprise. And the show is set 10 years before the beginning of the original series. So last week we talked about Christopher Pike being cast. Uh, well, this week we have news of that the, the visual representation of the Enterprise, why it was so different than the original series. And it's because it had to be. What do you mean? You didn't say it was different. How was it different? Well, it, just, it was modernized, of course. But there's also just extra things added to it uh-huh. uh, that were not in the original Enterprise. And the creators of the show say that, one, they had to actually uh, legally be uh, have elements that made it uh, visually different. So it could not be the look of the original Enterprise. Why? Because of the rights holding. But mm, I thought they had the rights. Okay. Yeah. It's confusing. Is this a picture? This is an actual picture from the this show. Is this is an actual picture. Pretty accurate to yeah, me. If, if you click to you go to Trek movie, uh, they have um, side by side comparisons. This feels like nerd picking, nerd nitpicking. Uh, hello, this show is Star Trek, and their j- uh, rationale for it is that because the this Enterprise is ten years older, uh, these parts, these added parts they put in the show uh, in, on the model could be uh, could be replaced, or could be removed later on okay but it's it's a good looking enterprise oh god i really like it all right all right uh last couple stories all right all right have you guys had you guys have an impossible burger right yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, i really enjoyed it there's actually a restaurant um close to my house that sells it it's like 15 dollars, so not not super cheap that's like as cheap as it's gonna get yeah yeah, so a lot of restaurants. They, I think, they launched it some high-end restaurants initially, and it was yeah. like twenty dollars, twenty-five dollars. It's important to say though that I've had it multiple places. It doesn't taste the same everywhere you go. All they do is supply the fake meat, and you then the it. restaurant cooks it. Totally, you have to season it. You have to butter it up. I mean, every restaurant will, will cook it differently. Mm-hmm. Well, one restaurant that may be the first place you can get a reasonably priced Impossible Burger mm-hmm. is surprisingly. White Castle. Shut up. They're not oh, doing the Impossible God. Burger. Gross. For $2, you can get an Impossible a Slider, <laughs> an Impossible White White Castle Slider, and Eric Bangman from Ars Technica went to his local White Castle. Isn't this like double the price of their normal slider, by the way? Yeah, it's like more than double the price. Yeah. The slider is like $0.77. Cents. Um, and the question is, did it have onions? Why is that the question? My question is, did it taste good? Because I hate the onions. That's the thing that makes me hate the, uh, the, what, the White Castle sliders. Because uh-huh. they have onions in it. <clears throat> but that's good bread. They got good bread on the Yeah, it's so, soft bread. Uh, uh, he did not, did not really like it. Has he had the Impossible Burger before? Who's uh, to say White Castle's cooking it right? What are the odds right. of that? That's right. I mean, Pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're cooking it the way they cook it, right? And it, it doesn't matter whether they're cooking it right, quote unquote, right. Like The fact is that this is a meat substitute that will make its way into yeah. restaurants and to grocery stores you. and you got to cook it the way you normally would cook your burger and so this is the fast food first fast food equivalent of the impossible burger which i think is super interesting i can't believe they can supply that much impossible meat yeah i'm interested to learn more about what their supply chain looks like because the whole argument for the impossible burger is that because it is plant-based we're reducing the total carbon footprint but if the meat. manufacturing is... But we don't totally know what the manufacturing looks like. It takes five cows to make one Impossible Burger. It's not about the cows. It's about the water. Mm. Like almonds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. The, the almonds of meat. <laughs> um, I can't wait for this to be on store shelves, though. I really, really? want to be able to take See, I would love to make burger. this at home. I don't you know, know, we should do a video and test when we when the Impossible Burger, when the Impossible Meat is ready. Because the way they sell to you, they have them it basically looks like gra- it's minced in, ground beef right it's, yeah. it's pink you could but it's edible in that state yeah because it's just made from peas. it's just plants you should eat it I, we want to eat it in that state you should do that in all it's not states, gonna taste good it, 
it's edible. Don't Let's not go overboard here, guys. The the Impossible Burger is is interesting as an alternative to the other other vegetarian options. Okay, you don't think it's, it's close like, enough? It's good. It's it's fine. It's mm. it's definitely not. A real burger, but it's also not a garden burger. It's not a bean burger. It's much better. It's than a garden something burger. different, and that's great. But I it, like that. There's it, something different. I think it's interesting on the low end, like at White Castle, where the burger is already not good. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. What's the delta there? This it does seem. This is strange. And no, I've never had an impossible. I've had it like three times now. All the times the patty has been real thin. I've never had I, like a. F- I think it does better G- thin. Right. But like if you, if you Google Impossible Burger and you go to Google Image Search, which sucks now, by the way. Um, you can get a plug-in. I, I, I must check that out. Yeah. Because even on mobile, Google Image Search sucks oh, now. That's trouble. Um, uh, the fo- first photo you see for Impossible Burger is this giant, juicy bar burger. And I've never seen one actually served that way. That's how mine was served. Oh, giant juicy bar burger? Yeah. yeah. Oh, but it, yeah. like, like Kishore it, said, it yeah. was all about the preparation. It was salty and well charred. Yeah, a jardinier and like it, I had it that way and it was it was delicious, but most places do like the kind of smash burger style. Mm. Mm. What if you had a stuffed impossible burger? With what? Cheese, blue cheese. Have, do they do that? Do they make stuffed burgers? Yeah. Totally. That, that sounds, Where have you been? No, this sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah, stuffed you, burgers are incredible. Are, are a great Where thing. Do you, I want one. How do you do this? <laughs> Where do you get this? Do they stuff it with any kind of cheese you want? No, no, no. So they're pre-packed. Like when they pack, pack oh, the patty. You what? just make it at home, what do you man. Mean they're pre-packed. Like they, when, when they pack the patty, don't they make pack the patty? When I order a burger at a nice restaurant, they make the patty. No, the patty is like already. Been you think packed. so? Yes. Oh, that's sad. Yes, they, with the, with the thin sheets of the wax paper between them. I thought that was just McDonald's. Not McDonald's. You're lucky if you get the wax. Some paper. angry commenters that work in restaurants are going to be like, "No, we, we grind our we, own. We, grind. we <laughs> grind only after when you order." <laughs> We grind side <laughs> table side grinding. We slaughter and moments after well, the you choose the calf ordered. that you want. To <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah. Oh god, just like a lobster, a red lobster. Mm. You know that lobster tank out in the lobby? You don't know. That's what you eat. Well, in Chinese restaurants, that's, that's exactly how it is. Yeah, you wave, wave, and say hi when you walk in. That's horrible. Before, what do you mean it's horrible? It's, it's delicious. You get you. Yeah. You see the biggest crab, the biggest lobster. Oh, I mean it's horrible for the lobster. They don't really feel anything. I can't believe you're talking about ordering lobsters after that SNL skit this weekend. Oh, what a great skit! You guys see that? I only saw the cold open. Oh, uh, John Mulaney was the guest, and um, Keenan Thompson did a. He had written this skit like five years ago when he worked on the show. And it was about somebody so, well, the, that... The, there's a premise, and then the execution is what really yeah. kills it. He the premise, up, I think, is hilarious. The premise is that somebody goes to a diner, like a Greek diner in New York, and orders the lobster special. Because look, it's on the menu. Why would you do that? Who orders lobsters from a diner? Well, someone wanted to try it. <laughs> and and then it ended up being a, a, um, a long musical sequence. Really? It's the best way I can, uh, it, without spoiling it. Wow. I, I don't want to yeah. go. go Keenan Thompson super, as the lobster. Okay. Super good. All right. Uh, we have a new Incredibles 2 trailer. Dun, dun, dun. Really excited for that Incredibles 2. I haven't watched it yet. Should I watch it? Because I'm already really, I'm all in, in on this movie. You're bought in. You got to just decide that for yourself, friend, if you're I, a trailer man or not. The only thing I'm excited about seeing from the trailer is if I get the villain in any interesting way. And I doubt I'll get that. Oh, I, you know what? There's not a clear villain like there was yeah. in the first one, at least not from the trailers. There's clearly people with the wrong priorities, but I don't get the sense that there's a villain shown yet. Did you? I did not watch the trailer. Oh, okay. Intentionally. No. I mean, I would watch it because it's it's got me really excited. I'm oh. already pretty excited. Like, yeah. If I'm at a 9.9. It rejuvenated my excitement in the way that, it would be if I just watched Incredibles for the first well, time. Well, that's what I want to do. Instead of re- instead of watching this trailer, I'm going to rewatch the original because it's been a while. Yeah. And but I think you that know, will help me prepare for some of the references if, maybe to the first film. Perhaps. But I imagine if you're like me, you know every beat of that film. And it's just... It's been it's, a while. It's been a hot minute. <laughs> well, then maybe rewatch it. It's nice to see. What what I found I found useful also is to get a little bit acclimated to the older actors because their voices are, oh, are a, little a little different bit, of course. now. Yeah, it's been over almost 10 years. Over 10 years. But the characters haven't aged. So that's <gasps> like something we have to... What do they do with the kids? Yeah. So you, we have to kind of get on board with that. Are there new voice actors for the kids? I can't imagine. That would change Sarah Vowell. I mean, she's so... Who's the boy? You know, Dash. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know his actual name. That that's uh, Jack Jack's voice must be changed. Yeah, I would imagine Jack Jack's has changed. Yeah, and that he's clearly part of the fun. Like they're still trying to figure out what he's what he can do. So I'm I'm excited for this film more than I ever have been. Mm. Watch it. You won't regret it. So Dash was played by this kid named Spencer Fox, who when the movie came out 10 years ago was a kid and now is not a kid (laughs) anymore. He was born in 93. So he's 25 now, <laughs> but he was 15 when it came out. Yeah, I don't know if I could get behind 25-year-old That's like playing when, Dash. When you saw the... How old do you think Sarah Bell is? Well, playing she, started, she, she was never start that, as that 10-year-old, yeah. as 15 years old. It's like when we saw the grown-up kid uh, baby who was on the cover of Nirvana's Nevermind. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That was great. What yeah. about the kid who played baby Luke Skywalker at the end of Revenge of the Sith? Uh, did we see him? Is he all grown up? I mean, I mean, I mean he must I, be. I, oh, yeah. I blotted. <laughs> he must be 10 years old. And then you could yeah. say, can say, I yeah. played Luke Skywalker. Blotted yeah. that out of my That's memory. Funny. As a baby. That's funny. Right? The only other actor to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. That's got to be top in of his I- IMDb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, in San Francisco, the city streets are changing. You know, not only do we have like a bunch of self-driving car companies doing testing on the streets, mm-hmm. now we have electric scooters everywhere so or go ahead i want to just emphasize how everywhere they are so i came to tesla this morning i parked on the street uh as i was paying for parking at the meter somebody rode up in one of these scooters got off and and parked it no, right by my car what type of scooters are these like vespas these or these look like the razor scooters no, dude, they're stand-up mm, razor scooters yeah, right yeah and the, but they're electric now when you say they yeah. parked it what what does that entail just leaving it there, <laughs> just like, just like dropping it on the side of of the sidewalk there. So I I want to know if other cities have this going on right now. I, I assume it's only major metropolis cities, but apparently we have a real problem in in San Francisco, and city council has gotten involved in it. What's this a problem? Because they're terrorizing the sidewalks. It is one hundred percent illegal to ride these on the sidewalks in any way, shape, or form. Because they're electric. Because they're electric. They're motorized. Just oh. like electric skateboards. I was gonna say, are they gonna crack down on the kids too? So how much power can how how far can you go on these? Uh I think they can go twenty miles an hour, maybe fifteen miles an hour. And as far as how far they can go, they're I mean, I imagine it's at least as far as an electric skateboard, which is so six, seven miles. Gunther and Ryan used these in LA when you were down at oh. that at that shoot. Uh, so they, they they rent them by the hour. Like you find if I think if you find one, you can rent it. And yeah, there's an app that comes up with a barcode. You scan it. It can it links to your credit card through the app. It costs it, a, a matter of dollars to rent it. It's a dollar to rent it, and then there's some. Well, the one that I know is called Lime. Yeah, it's a dollar to rent it, and then there's some mileage based fee on it. But the idea is like it's a quick way to go like four or five blocks. Um, or you could walk four or five blocks. No, but it's not as quick. Not as quick. Sure. I actually kind of <laughs> sort of understand this. Oh, they look fun. Yeah, I mean, and also, I haven't been terrorized on the sidewalk by these things. A helmet's required for these? Yes, it is. You are required to wear a helmet. Uh, was the person who parked his? No. No, no. No, and people aren't yeah. wearing Oh, so they go up to 50 miles an hour. 50? 15. Oh, geez, okay. There's also kind of a fun, fun sidebar. So these are charged because they have electricity in them. Sure. <laughs> and the way they do do this is they hire people uh, through the app to go pick up the chargers, take them back to their house, charge them at their home, and drop them off, and they get paid through the app. What? Yeah, so you can sign up to be a charger. They send you, like, a proprietary charger. Um you oh, that, go, I was wondering, like, there's no docking stations for these. That's right. So you drop them off at someone's house and they're... No, no, no. You, like, the person that's the charger drives around, picks up a bunch of them, and there is sort of a bounty per scooter. Are that, they, this they is kind of interesting. variable pricing based on how hard it is, how to, difficult how, how it is. How far it was to get that. So, you, like, you have an SUV or a pickup truck, you're driving around literally picking up scooters parked, 
on the side of the street. You charge and then them, charging them and overnight, them. and you're supposed to put them back in a specified zone, and and they encourage you to. How to is park this working? Them. How are these not just stolen? Well, how do they find them? Are they GPS? It's in the app. Yeah, there's some GPS. Oh, so is is the thought that these only work motorized? Like you can't you can't kick you can't kick them. Yeah, right? I think the wheels lock. Right, so they only work motorized, and the charger must be proprietary. So if someone stole one, they couldn't. Uh, once once you're out of power, that's it. Yeah. So they don't lock. You don't lock these to anything. The person who dropped it off didn't lock it to anything. Because no. the bikes, you you have to lock them. You're supposed to lock them to things. Mm-hmm. I don't wow. see what the big deal is. Why is the city council up in arms about this? It, the city council wouldn't care if they weren't getting complaints every day from people saying, I almost got hit by one of these on the sidewalk, and they're yeah. driving me crazy. And they're just dropping them off, as you said, willy-nilly, anywhere against buildings. And the city impounded like 60 of these things in one day last So you can make what, some money charging them. What a waste of time. Just let people ride around on scooters. It's not that big of a menace. Well, you see, I, I, I have not had a problem with them, but apparently like it's not a one-time article. There's article after article about people having I don't know. issues. That's just media stuff. Getting hit. I like anything that takes more potentially more cars off the road. Yeah. Like I just can't see that as a bad thing in major cities. Right. Well, what they need to do... And then I'm going to go get hit by a scooter out here and change my mind. There needs to be a third lane for boosted boards and electric scooters and any of these kind of vehicles. You mean bike lane? No, in addition to the bike lane. No, you're talking about fundamental changes in in, in infrastructure. Aren't we talking about a fundamental shift here? We are. We're trying to get... No, we're talking about We can barely get, you know, citywide Wi-Fi. We can barely get fiber optics, everyone. In San Francisco. You're saying it's logistically you know, Logistically difficult? very, very difficult. I'm with you on that. In old cities. However, I do think that a third lane is what we are looking at here eventually. And maybe Elon Musk is going to put it underground. But we need a way for these electric vehicles to get around safely and legally. Yeah, yeah. And you know, maybe this type of... I mean, it makes a lot of sense in cities, of course. But San Francisco is a topographically interesting city. <laughs> yes. And so it's maybe... You, you San mean SF. Yes, it's very, we are very hilly. Um, I'm not sure it's the best place for it. I don't think this would fly in other cities. Like, do you think people would get away with this in New York? They would get they get murdered by the pedestrians. They would get just like yeah. clothesline. Be- yeah, What's well, a good city battered. for this? It's, you know, it's something something like a uh, L.A. I could see parts of L.A. like a Silver Lake, a, a suburb suburbs maybe. No, I think it's too far for suburbs. All right, Portland, Portland, Great sure, for Portland. Seattle, not Seattle's bad. kind of hilly. Mm-hmm. Also, also interesting topography. Anyway, if you have other other places in the country who have this, uh, who have these scooters, let us know and how you guys are Austin. dealing with it. Austin, Austin, could Austin work. would be really good for it. Yeah. All right. Some uh, some product news. Um, let's jump to the, the Apple Watch stuff. Oh, Jeremy, right. you have an Apple Watch. I have an Apple Watch. Not today because I forgot to charge it. Oh well, your battery might be exploding. Uh, so I think my wife's battery did. It mm. bulged out and the whole thing popped apart. Whoa. And, yeah. Was it a Series 2? It was Series 1. Oh. OG. It's too bad. If you have a Series 2... No, they did. They won't turn series on. One too. Oh, they also... Yeah. Okay. Uh, ser- series 2 models will get free repair when uh, the fo- uh, the watch won't power on or if there's a swollen battery. There so it may be a known problem. doesn't affect the, the small, the 38 millimeter units, apparently. It, Only the 42 millimeter, the big one. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. my wife's was the small. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. G- got a lemon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Big update to Apple. Uh, Max uh, came out a while ago uh, for uh, external GPU support. These were for Radeon graphics cards. Uh, this was uh, at the end of March, the new High Sierra update. And uh, makes a lot of sense for MacBooks with your th- that Thunderbolt, uh, Thunderbolt connection. Uh, something you're considering getting, potentially, Jeremy? Oh, hell no. No, no. no. Why would no? You don't want external GPU? You don't want to do UVR? No, my God. The idea of an external GPU is so repulsive to me. You could be mining Bitcoin on that. <laughs> no, God, no. Why no. is it that repulsive? Oh, because it's just, it's, I want, no, I'll get a PC. Uh, if I it's get an enclosure, If right? I get a MacBook, with power. it's like it's done, not done. That's my computer. You don't dock it at home? No, I don't dock it. No, it's that's the computer. Wow. Not even if, for somebody out there that uses like a, a Mac, a MacBook is their primary thing. Get an external GPU so they can do VR with it. I just, I don't, their G- external GPUs are so overpriced. Yeah. Forget it. I'll, I'll just get a PC and, and game on that if I want to. What, why would you do that? I mean, I guess 
I guess you're just you're desperate for more power and you have a a portable. Or you're a developer. A you game know? developer? Yeah, There's game. no game developers on Mac. Who knows? <laughs> I think they're We try. Apple Apple, uh, Apple is is encouraging like VR development. Uh, but there are some caveats. One, of course, only Radeon cards, no NVIDIA cards. Uh, also, no support in boot camp. If you boot up Windows, do you do, still do boot camp on your Mac? I think I might still have it installed, but I don't use it. You never use Windows no. on Mac? No. Mm. Well, if you do use Windows on Mac, you don't have eGPU uh, support. Um, uh, and uh, Thunderbolt 3, of course, is required. And then also, interestingly, uh, your built-in display... Mm-hmm. Cannot use the graphics card, only external displays. Yeah, okay. I mean that makes. I mean, I so it's only you know that. when you're docking it and plugging into a, another monitor. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, our second guy did some uh, performance, and as expected, you know, it's good. It's much better than your built-in GPU. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but no other caveats if you if you're looking to buy a new uh, MacBook Pro. Um, Something I've said for a long time with the iPhone 10 is the gesture features are maybe the best thing, best thing about in, in iPhone 10. I was just at lunch yesterday. Yeah. And somebody was complaining about the Apple TV remote, right? I hate Apple. TV Everyone remote. hates it. Hate it's it. Like, and is it? It's asymm- You know, it's too symmetrical. Um, people don't understand that the touchpad is a button when they first use it. Things like this. And um, and it's like you know everyone hates it. I, I don't mind it that much. But you know what? What I do mind. And I handed him my iPhone 10 having opened an app and I said close that app that's closing the app is different because there's no button there's a yeah. hold pressing to hold the button dude couldn't do it once you do it once no problem I'm just saying it's not intuitive and uh, ever since we lost that supposed, button you're not supposed to close the app anyway everyone Jeremy. everyone knew how to close an app you're not supposed with to close the original app. iPhone that's not everyone unnecessary you never <laughs> need to close apps you never need to swipe up apps hey all right so tell me how good swiping is the cards, the fact that that bar on the bottom of the iPhone 10 lets you swipe between yeah. your different apps mm-hmm. and swipe up to go to the home screen, yeah. that is an incredibly smooth and useful feature, Okay, I think. Um, and I think it's a feature that uh, Apple should put in non-iPhone 10 iPhones. There's theoretically, even in the iPhone 8, which has the button, um, which serves the same functionality, I think that feature is more useful than the button. That'll be super confusing. I, I on those phones. I, I, the button is there. I now that I have an iPhone 10, I yeah. do do that on my iPod Mini or what is it, iPad Mini, where you you want to swipe yeah. between apps. So I think they need parity. Right, right. I, I'm but they won't. They won't do it. Uh, but Android may do it. And so um, Android P, which is uh, coming out this year, looks like not only will it support notch displays, but there's a screenshot that indicates it's going to have an iPhone 10 like strip. Uh, between between uh, on the bottom that lets you swipe between cards. This is a mega rumor. <laughs> Screenshot was deleted Uh-oh. after um, posting. Um, so uh, that blog post that uh, the developer posted got deleted. Uh, you, you, go ahead. Oh, I'm mixed on it. I've tried mm. that that gesture thing. It's so good. I, I don't feel that strongly about it. You know what sucks about the multitasking on iPhone ten is you can't throw these cards away anymore. They don't let you do that. You have to hold it down and then X. You're, you're going back out. to the same problem, which is you can't X you can't X out of them. You can't close quote unquote quote, quote unquote close them out of out of um, storage. If I'm in that multitasking menu, yeah, with the old iPhone, I could throw them away. Throw them away is the same thing as hitting the X. Yeah, exactly. But right. now I have to hold it down for a second, yeah, and yeah. then tap a very specific pixel on the screen. It's a, it's, it's a, a circle, a red circle. It says minus, which indicates delete. What? This is a worse experience. It's a worse experience. I think though, I w- use that so much. The swiping between apps. Yeah, no, that but that's different. That's the best. This is the best part of the iPhone yeah. 10, I think. No, that uh, that's great. That's good. I love that. That's good. I love that if you don't wait too long. Like the chronological yeah. aspect of your apps, mm-hmm. you're actually going backward and forward. It works with how you think of apps. Yeah. And if you do wait long enough, then that gets the app that you're, um, the screen you're on gets bumped to the top. My, uh, my argument has always been that the removal of the home button is a compromise, and we are making compromises in order to get a bigger screen. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I was going <laughs> to ask, how important is it to have that extra bit of real estate? Because that's what this is really about. Right. The bar on the bottom of the iPhone 10, which is below that bottom row of apps, is used 
in every application now for these gesture tools. Um, and so you lose any tapping on the bottom for anything within an app for third-party developers. And we know all these notch phones are coming out on Android, uh, and Android's going to support them. So yeah. is that is that just a natural consequence of just reclaiming every bit of space that they have to go to this? Well, they could always put a button on the side. I know you don't like that. No, I just think that's hard to do with how Android rolls out uh, no. across so many different platforms. Mm -hmm. We may have the answer soon because Google I.O. is, what, next month? Yeah. And yeah. if there's going to be an announcement, it's probably there as well where, where we'll get it. Okay. All right. Um, moving on. Uh, do, 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 do. We have, oh, hey, speaking of uh, Google I.O., we might see a new Gmail redesign. Heck yeah, dude. Really? Now, you yeah. guys excited about this? Do you know why? so I'll, good. I'll tell you why, because I am an inbox user, and I have been on the iPhone ten since it came out, which is what, like six months ago? And the inbox has not been updated yet, and it, so it doesn't use the whole screen. So this kind of like bugs me, and now I think I know why. Because inbox is becoming Gmail. Mm -hmm. They're incorporating the greatest feature of Inbox, which is snoozing. But they're talking about Gmail on web, web Gmail, gmail.com. It's going to be the same. They're going to roll. It's going to be paired. Gmail on mobile and Gmail on gmail.com yeah. are two different, completely different interfaces. I, I think they're going to tie them all together. Mm. It's going to be Gmail. And they're getting rid of Inbox, which explains why it hasn't been updated. They're just rolling the good features of Inbox into Gmail. And I think Gmail users are going to like it. Uh, well, I don't know. Gmail users are picky because yeah. you remember the last time they tried to redesign something where they broke some stuff? No. This was probably, I don't know, five, six years ago. <laughs> and like people were really mad. Um, I frankly think it's, it unifies the UI with how assistant works. Mm -hmm. And, and so this represents just basically making all of their design look the same. Um, at least the design of the places they're investing in. Yeah. So I think this is great. I think it's streamlined everything that's in here, like compose, new messages, all of it's still there where you want it to be. Uh, it just makes more sense. Even my wife, who's not a techie by any stretch of the imagination, loves snoozing because she can clear out her inbox and get the nice zero inbox feeling. And then they come back when you, when you want them to because people are treating the inbox as a to-do list. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely. Um, something that may not be at Google I.O., but it was released on the Google Research blog this week is a really cool peer, uh, bit of research and, and experimental technology uh, using um, video and computer vision to analyze a scene and to isolate audio between speakers in a scene. Wait, okay, <clears throat> not overlapping audio. No. Uh, well... Actually, it is overlapping yeah. audio. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's just two people speaking at the... At the same time? That's real Lieutenant Data now, stuff. No, the video they showed didn't... It wasn't like they were directly talking over each other. It was sort of that overlapping that happens conversationally. Okay. Huh. So I mean, what, what it does is it basically takes one audio feed, like, like a YouTube video, and, and it makes a lot of sense for what they would do for YouTube, and analyze this. If you have talking heads, for example, mm -hmm. it can identify who's talking by whose mouth is moving, whose mouth is not moving, and then s isolate that audio onto, not like to put it in left-right stereo, but into a separate audio track, which then can then be analyzed for you know, Google voice recognition purposes, um, for machine learning purposes, or for some more consumer-facing stuff if you want to just hear uh, one person and, and dim the audio of a, uh, of a crowd, for example. That's great. That's great. This is a natural progression towards a uh, true AI. I love the visualization of these kind of research demos because it, it's exactly how the visualization would be on like a robot looking at people. Yeah. Uh, portrayed in a movie, mm -hmm. right? Like the box around a person's head. Yeah. Like kind of kind of shifting around statically, like target, 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 and yeah, and that's exactly what's happening right now. Um, let's go about Bitcoin a little bit. Okay. Hey, what's Coinbase? Well, Coinbase is a San Francisco-based exchange where it is the most popular place to convert real U.S. dollars, fiat currency, into Bitcoin. <laughs> fiat currency? Or back. So it's a way to convert back and forth from Bitcoin to cash. Okay. All right. It's a place if you have a Bitcoin, you can 
Cash out? Yes, you can cash out. It is where you go at the end of the, your trip to the uh, casino. Is it just Bitcoin or is it all of the crypto? It is only Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash, I want to say. So it's just a select yes, couple. Yes, very small select. Yeah, their, their main competition in the U.S. is Gemini. And they only do, I want to say, Bitcoin and Litecoin. So they, this Coinbase company just acquired a company called earn.com and it's a way to for you to make bitcoin by performing tasks make bitcoin by performing tasks like task rabbit i think so thing? and also replying to emails they say is one of the things why bitcoin i don't know i mean i can't i just get paid the, I, I guess the promise <laughs> is that they're paying you the smaller than uh money the the, the fiat currency equivalent yeah with the promise the hope that uh, that what you're getting paid in will go up in value because of how volatile it is. Would you do that? Let's say, uh, let let forget the the task part of this. Would you accept payment? Let's say I've Venmo, respect, I've accepted I've accepted lunch payment. Yeah, in uh, the form of Litecoin. I've seen is that. What right? He has, and I have. It has not worked out. <laughs> the, the, the fourteen dollars I received is now only worth like eight dollars. But what do you think of, of that strategy? It's like gambling in real life. In, in the moment. I mean, if I want Bitcoin, I can get paid in cash and buy Bitcoin. I'm not sure why I have to get paid in Bitcoin. Right. Gambling. Right. The money I can use, it's not as, I mean, it, this is about increasing liquidity, right? About making, making it like more, a more usable currency in everyday transactions. Right. Um, and I don't think it's, it's at that point yet. It's not like there's nothing as convenient. In, in fact, Fiat currency is getting more convenient to use with things like Apple Pay and Venmo um, and, and Tap to Pay. Like, I sent you Apple Pay and you complained. Well, I think all these services do a stupid thing in that they put it in a reservoir. Like, they, they put it in their own bucket. Yeah. And that's how they make money. That's how they, they make interest. They make interest, they on, make interest yeah. on the bucket. You followed the money. Just, just like, just like uh, you know, uh, uh, Apple, PayPal, Venmo. And, you know, it's not like PayPal hasn't been doing this forever. But people thought of their PayPal accounts as separate, maybe than like than their bank accounts. They weren't yeah. making any interest on it, but it was for a certain type of transactions, eBay auctions, that type of commercial stuff. Venmo being used as something, and it's owned by the same company. Venmo being used as something for daily transactions has worked, but it used to be real tough for to be. It used to be like not even default for taking money out of your Venmo when you're paying. So you're only feeding money into the system. It used to be. Right. Now it's the default. You can make it from your bank account or whatever. Or from, I guess, from a credit card. Same with Apple Pay, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Ooh. Android Pay does the same thing. Or Google Pay, sorry. Yeah, and at scale, they're making a lot of interest off the money you're not using. Yeah. And you're just putting in there. And they're encouraging you to continue to use their but service. But you know what? That's okay because they, they stop charging, really. Like, if you send money to your friends, there's Between no Between bank accounts, there's sure. No, no, even if, like, you have money in... Yeah, you're right. Between between PayPal accounts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the PayPal, you know, all, all, they always make you distinguish between... Friends and family are goods and services. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure there are plenty of people who make transactions identifying themselves as friends and family who are just doing it for goods and services. No, no, no. Nobody does that. What? It's against the rules. Against the rules. You don't get any pri- uh, consumer protection if you do that. Ah. Uh-huh. That's the reason. Huh. No consumer protection. That's good advice. It's yeah. almost like people might be using it for black market sale of goods. Well, I thought that's what Bitcoin wow. is for. Yeah, it is. And we come full circle. Uh. Most exciting story this week in technology. This is I've been waiting for this. Uh, Labo, first of all, comes out. Nintendo Labo comes out this Friday. We'll be we'll be putting it together. Rest assured. Did you get both kits? Yeah. We'll be at Best Buy at midnight Thursday night. No, we're getting a ship to us. <laughs> it's gonna get me delivered. We're gonna put it together. It's gonna arrive at four p.m. on on Friday. That's gonna suck. Uh, there is a new patent that got uncovered uh, for Nintendo devices. That make so much sense, and I could see this being a ton of fun. Mm-hmm. The patent is for multiple Switch screens, Nintendo Switch screens, without the oh, controllers, yeah. Yeah. to be aligned together uh-huh. in any pattern. So if the three of us had Switch screens, we could connect them and make a triangle. Okay. And okay. then to play games yeah. between them with the screens knowing where they are in relation to each other. Nope, can't. Doesn't work that way. Well, well, can. Because the patent shows that you can calibrate 
by drawing a line. Oh, that's clever. Isn't that clever? Yeah. If you connect two screens together and Damn. I draw a vector, and oh no, the point from point A to point oh, B. Yeah, Nintendo. Isn't that cool? That's great. That is super cool. And, and that means you can play games where there can be empty space between the screens, and yet there's still gameplay happening there. I love this company. All sorts of weird things could be happening. Now, it wouldn't work in real time if you like shifting your screen, right? Realigning. Yeah. Right, making your screen a, a, a some type of tabletop controller, or could it with with some positioning? Well, wait a minute. You're still talking about them being in the same plane. Yes. Do they have to be in the same plane? Yes. It looks like with the patent, they, they are flat in the same. What? <laughs> Look, how does that work? There's even a banana. There's for a scale. banana. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about making like a walls. Yeah, ninety degree switch. angle. And again, I guess if you just draw the vectors and it's saying draw a line between screen one and screen it two, it should understand its orientation and, and and tell it you know they are against each other in this way. Oh, because it has a gyro. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Oh, what 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 magic? Yeah. What magic is this? And then I why is there a banana on there? Are they saying that you can do like projection mapping where it looks like something from the right angle? No, because you need eye tracking for that. Well, it would only work from one angle. Like, it wouldn't continue. Oh, like an adapt. optical illusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't know. even work well at it, that one angle. Only with one eye closed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much opportunity here for interesting gameplay. Oh, yeah. This is super cool. This is definitely cool. The Switch you already bought is only getting better. What are you going to, like, you can't. So, A, come on. It's a patent filing. That's true. Uh, true. Like, let's not get too excited. True. Yeah. I, I think it's the promise of what of what this represents. Because then you can have, like, I just think about Mario Kart in this way. <laughs> right? No. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Why? Because if you have Mario Kart in two different planes, you mm -hmm. get to see a lot more of the field of view. Oh, you're saying it's, you could do like a wide Oh, multi-monitor. Multi yeah. It's like yeah. PC gaming. <laughs> PC gaming. <laughs> no, but you could set up one that shows like you can look to the side, yeah. which is oh. a view you don't have. Wow. Okay. So you would need to buy multiple switch switches to do that. Oh, sure. I mean... If we're talking about crazy Kart. ideas right now. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, you could use you could have 100 switches and have a 10 by 10 grid and have a billboard mm -hmm. with one video playing across all of them. I just love this calibration idea. It's so the, simple. The, yeah, of just drawing a line. This is a Steve Jobs level idea. Well, the Steve Jobs level idea would be to have it automatically aligned to each other. Well, no, he he like I'm just imagining our styluses that we were born with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every human. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 10 of them. Yeah, so simple to use. Uh, something that's not a, not a simple problem to solve is self-driving cars. We've, of course, had have had Tesla in a, recently in the news with some problems uh, with, um, with some collisions involving their cars that may or may not have involved um, the, uh, the autonomy features. Mm -hmm. And um, Model 3 production is, of course, very uh, not at the pace at which... I think anyone had hoped for it. Uh, Elon Musk has said that you know has admitted the problem has been in their their uh, their uh, building processes that you know they have maybe too there many robots. There wasn't a smooth process yeah. going from manufacturing a few of these to a lot of these. Yeah, they they built up a whole conveyor system that they had to disassemble because it wasn't it wasn't right. You know they've only been making cars for a couple of years now, and and even though they're they're using the same factories that plenty of cars are made in. It's the complexity of the cars and also uh, maybe just inefficiencies that they I refuse think to work around. Anytime you go to that level of automation in your manufacturing processes, yeah. you're going to hit problems. Yep. And I think the demand for these Teslas, I don't know what their expectations were internally, but the demand is so incredibly high. Even if demand it was, was half or a quarter of where we are right now, uh, they'd be much more on track. Um so I'm not surprised that they're hitting problems with this kind of automation. Well, one of the promises of the Tesla isn't that it's an electric car, but it is the autonomy features. Right now, you pay $5,000 for the ability, if you have a new Tesla, to have um, autopilot, right? The, the stage two or stage three autopilot where I can stay in lanes, you know, can change speed, keep a distance from cars, can change lanes, uh, but it cannot get you completely from point A to point B autonomously because it can't navigate city streets. And Tesla has always promised with some of the dormant cameras in their cars that this is something that will be possible in the future. And mm -hmm. you'd have to pay another $3,000 to to unlock that feature. Yeah. Uh, some people are thinking that it may not be possible. 
and that the who? not some 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 car makers oh. um because uh right now a uh, lot of other car a- autonomous car researchers are using lidar right lidar sensors yeah. that, uh, and tesla only uses computer vision only uses cameras i thought they'd use some radar or lidar no no they, they, the radar they use is the uh, the distance between the, the, the one that all dumb cars have oh, okay you know, one of the problems the, the lidar is heavy and energy intensive as it currently stands. So it's not sort of miniaturized in the is way. Is that a problem? For huh. Tesla's manufacturing process. That's the way I huh. understand it. Hmm. And so Tesla believes that the, the driving assist features they have in their car will pave the path for full autonomy. That you won't need any special extra hardware. That they, are, they have a roadmap that says with the current technology, hardware, yeah. current processing power that's in these cars, <coughs> current camera systems, you'll get full autonomy. It's just a matter of software. And... Not everyone thinks that that will be the case. So, has anyone been in a car that did the self parking, the parking assist, whatever they call it? No, I haven't either. But every car commercial I watch is now promoting that technology. Uh, is it that much of a game breaker? I understand what you're saying. You're saying something much longer term with that feature. But is it even a short term pe- feature that people are really clamoring for? What parking, parking assist? I don't know. But like every car commercial is pushing it right yeah. now. Um, I don't get. I don't. It. Know. I know how to parallel park really well. So I know how to park too. Some people don't. So maybe we're not the target audience. Maybe car. Cars. Maybe that we require the fundamental infrastructure change where cars can't park. What cars shouldn't park. You, you just stop. You, cars should <laughs> just stop. Pull pull into a lane like a scooter. <laughs> you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pull into a a, a, a drop off lane. Person gets out. Car moves on. No more parallel parking. So if Tesla does not deliver on this, if they if a year from now they're like, uh, our bad, you actually need three thousand yeah. dollar upgrade in order to get autopilot. Well, no, it's already a three thousand dollar upgrade. I mean, in addition, oh, like a hardware upgrade. You can pay it. You can do it now. You can go all in and pay for your fully autonomous now when you buy a car, and <laughs> then for, it, for it's features just, that won't unlock. Then it just unlocks whenever it unlocks. Is that is that a discounted early adopter price? I don't think so. Although, why would anyone do it? So they can be done with it. Then Tesla will take that money, include it in the car payment, make money on the oh interest. My goodness, exactly. Which but is convert it to doing. Litecoin. But, so if they do do that, don't you think that Tesla will say, "If you've already paid, it's on us"? No, you don't think so. No. Wow. No. That would that would not go over well. And guess what? They gotta make money. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But that's not gonna go over well. You're not. Are you gonna do fully autonomous? No. I'm not going to buy into fully autonomous right now when it's not actually a real feature. Why why do I give them $3,000 for something I can't use? Okay. I think that's the right decision. Yeah, I'll I'll pay for the semi-autonomous, right? Because that's a a feature that can be used. Yeah. Um, And and we'll see how it actually works. Pay for the parking assist. I want to know how it works. No. Is that a separate fee? No. I have no idea. (laughs) Um, Self-driving cars, we hear a lot about them uh, being tested in, in the United States and a lot of U.S. companies experimenting with them. Um, but of course, it's all also being tested all around the world, and uh, a place that we don't look to often in terms of car technology is uh, China, and uh, Alibaba, uh, the biggest tech company in China, uh, have been working also been working on autonomous car technologies, and got the go ahead from the Chinese government to use this technology on in Beijing roads. Because the promise of the Thomas cars is that it will decrease congestion no, everywhere. No, but this is like Amazon working on it. That's what Alibaba is to me. They're Amazon in China. Yeah, but Amazon's working on some crazy stuff, man. Like, Alexa came out of nowhere. But, but what, why? Like, because it just tech makes companies no feel like sense. if they don't spend the R&D and they don't dip their foot into it, they'll be left behind somehow. Because they got to pivot at some point. Every company does. Microsoft doesn't make Windows anymore. They make servers. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. They got uh, they got money. They got they got money is the reason exactly. Uh, I think that does it for technology news. Unless anyone else, no. Yeah. Do you, do you have any words to say from us? Anyone sponsoring the show? Ah, uh, we want to go there right now. All right. I don't know. Well, this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is brought to you by Udemy, the largest marketplace for online learning. Whether you want to learn something new or just sharpen your skills, Udemy has an extensive library of over 65,000 courses taught by expert instructors. 
ever find yourself thinking, I wish I could do that? Well, with Udemy, you can. Uh, they have web development to digital marketing to Japanese cooking courses, something for everyone. And while other online learning companies charge hundreds of, hundreds of dollars per class, Udemy courses start at only $11.99. Each course also comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for risk-free learning. And every day, students around the world choose Udemy to discover new passions, expand their skills, and even change careers. Improve your life through learning. Download the Udemy app to learn anytime or visit www.ude.my slash test today. That's www.ude.my slash test. And thank them for sponsoring this week's episode. Now it's time for a moment of science. So yesterday... We're recording this on a Tuesday. So Monday, there was supposed to be a launch of the TESS Space Telescope. Uh, but unfortunately, that launch got scrapped. Hopefully, by the time you're listening to this, the launch has happened. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about TESS. TESS is a space telescope that is looking for transiting planets over stars. We've talked about transiting planets over stars mm. many times, looking for that small dip in the um, in the visible light that's coming off of stars to identify planets, what Tess is interesting, uh, why Tess is interesting is, is I think a couple reasons. Kepler looked at this really narrow patch of the night sky uh, and found at this point two thousand three hundred planets uh, and more are kind of in the works that it, that it's going to find. This two year mission it has four cameras on it, and the way it deploys is that. These cameras look at a 24 by 24 degree um, field of the night sky. And that doesn't sound big, but that adds up to a huge um, field of view. And they have four cameras, so you're getting this sort of uh, massive picture of the sky every time it, it, uh, it takes a peak. And in each area, uh, it will look for 28 days in this arena looking for different dips. And over the course of a two-year mission, it'll map the entire night sky. It's also entering this weird elliptical orbit that takes it out past the moon. Or, well, I think like near the moon and comes back to Earth. It's this really strange elliptical orbit to give this sort of unimpeded view uh, of, of the sky. It's really looking at... Does it, it has thrusters on it to do that kind of thing? No, no, no. It's just getting launched into this oh, wacky gotcha, orbit. Gotcha. Um, right out. I'm sure there's thrusters on the device to keep it Just under control. Yeah, things, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I think is interesting is it's going to look at stars reasonably close to us to see if they have planets as well. Uh, the latest estimates put the number of planets in the Milky Way galaxy at uh, around two billion. Wow, that is a few. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, we should be able to get better analysis than Kepler gave on the composition of these planets uh including uh potentially their atmosphere so this could take us from 2000 planets uh in the next two years up to 200,000 so a very exciting thing it's really a bridge to get us uh to some of the other space telescopes and ground-based telescopes that are launching in the in the next few years which will give us much more detailed information on this so this is a 200 million dollar project uh, I'm really excited for what it's going to see. Probably in the next, I'm betting, 18 months or so, we'll get some initial data uh, published on what planets this thing has found. And just given the success of, of uh, Kepler, this is going to find just a metric shit ton of planets. What was the two billion figure? Was that suns with planets orbiting them? Uh, no, just planets. So, I mean, planets are, planets. by definition, orbiting a star. So there's more suns than there are planets. Because there's hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way. That's the current estimate based off of what Kepler is. There, there are people that think there are more planets in the Milky Way than there are stars. stars. Okay. Wow. I, I don't know. Hmm. Um, I don't know about that. Because hmm. there are more, way more stars without any planets. We just don't know because we've only looked at this narrow patch of sky at this point. Uh because there's a lot of stars that we didn't expect to have planets that have shown up to have planets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're just looking at this transit method. There is other stars like in our plane that we can't use that method for. Um, okay. Hey, we were promised last week that we would have 
lots of new info on NASA's InSight launch, the new lander from Mars. Well, I have information for oh, you about let's InSight. Hear it. Let's hear it. InSight is launching in about a month. It's launching from Vandenberg Air Force uh, Base. Listener Grant Henninger asked, hey, why are they launching out of California? Because usually you launch out of Florida. And the reason you launch out of Florida is both you, uh, if there's an accident, it falls in the Atlantic Ocean. And also, when you launch that way, you get the sort of gravity assist of the Earth rotation. So it kind of pushes it out cool. farther. Well, uh, in this case, um, uh, InSight is so lightweight that they don't need that little boost. Um, and it's so small, they're going to use this sort of polar trajectory because it gets them a better alignment with Mars. So hmm. usually stuff that launches out of Vandenberg in California goes in this polar or orbit. So that's why I grant. Okay. Um, InSight has two main instruments on it. It has a driller that okay. has a thermocouple on it, basically a measuring temperature density as it drills down. I think about 18 meters is a, as it's going, and well, they think that's enough. How to do they drill that first? Far? First, describe InSight's look. Like, how is this compared to Curiosity? What, what do you cu mean it's look? Curiosity, like it's Uvra, like it's a well, well, general well, mood, just like, like as as a, a lander. Who are you wearing InSight? Does it look like the, the Curiosity? Uh, it doesn't. No, it doesn't look like Curiosity. It doesn't have the wheels. What? No, it's not a rover. Is it a hovercraft? In that way. No, it looks more like, um, what's the one? Opportunity. Like it has like an unfolding. It's not an instrument that's designed to move because oh. it's drilling down. <clears throat> oh. Um, Fascinating. So that drill, I think, goes down about 18 meters, and it'll give us that sense of, of the temperature gradient in the... Um, in Mars, which would give us an understanding of how um, how much heat is left is over inside the meters? planet. meters? I think it's 18 that's meters. Crazy. That's crazy. That's amazing. super deep. That's how amazing. does, how, what? Wow. Yeah, I don't know how that works. Uh, sure. We can talk about that uh, another time. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the landing mechanism like? Is it a parachute? Uh, there is like some sort of parachute -y thing. Yeah, it's not like an inflatable ball that bounces. No, they have. That's right. They have I forgot about that one. <laughs> um, I mean, ha are, how accurate is their landing position? Uh, I think it's fairly accurate to within a, a few hundred meters. They have <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the other thing it has on it is a seismometer, and it's looking for Mars quakes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's not earthquakes. That's right. Yeah, because it's on Mars. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be looking for um, some inference from those from those quake data composition of of the planet. So this is really a geology tool. Cool. Is it revealing the heart of Mars? Is it atomically powered? Solar. Oh, I actually don't know how it's solar. Powered. There are solar panels on it, but usually there is some sort of nuclear radiation source on these things too. Mm. Um, got to keep the stranded astronauts warm. <laughs> yeah, got to keep them warm. <laughs> Speaking of, have you guys played Surviving Mars yet? No. What's that? It's a it's a new game out that is sort of like a um, uh, none. Or, what am I trying to say? Is uh, it a sim? Yeah, it's kind of like a sim. Uh -huh. That's the word I was looking for. Um, where you have to survive a certain amount of time on on Mars. You have it's very complicated in terms of the number of mechanics in it and the the idea. But you get essentially launched from Earth with a certain budget from a, a nation state. And you get resupply missions. It's actually quite beautiful to look at. You but, played you played this? Uh, I tried it out. Will has been playing it on uh -huh. his stream, and I tried it out. It's I'm only a, a few souls in, uh, but, but it's you always die. It's exceptionally difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how do you the do? astronaut no, road like? No, but it like you have to order certain like engineers, botanists, geologists. Um, you have to create you know reasons for people on Mars to have fun. You have to create bars and and stuff. Uh, Will does not care for geologists. That's what I have to r report out on that. Hmm. All right. One last question. Okay. This is about your bathroom behavior. Imagine you're going to a public restroom. Yep. Yes. Yes. You have the option, paper towel mm -hmm. or hand dryer. Paper towel, always. Well, it's a, yeah, that's not very okay, let's friendly ex of you. Let's expend a pan on it. One paper towel. Paper, paper towel, the old school hair dryer. Hand dryer. A air, old school hand dryer. Hand dryer. Oh, you the don't Dyson mean hand dryer, mm. okay, mm -hmm. or one of those accelerator hand dryers. What's an accelerator? Hand that one that makes just a ton of noise and it shoots out that the faster jet of air. 
What? <laughs> Wait, I don't know. What? I'm gonna Google so, it. like, the old hand dryers are, like, slow, and yeah. it's, like, yeah. barely warm. Mm-hmm. Then they have the accelerator, which shoots out a higher velocity amount of air. And then there's the Dyson hand dryer. Uh, I would go, if, if I had to use, if paper towels weren't an option. No, no, paper use, towels are still an option. Paper, paper towels. towels still, paper towels. Jeremy? Um, <clears throat> I also prefer paper towels. I'm going to be honest about that. I know it's not environmentally friendly. Now, I will say that I did use a pretty powerful hand dryer that was mounted in this bathroom uh, probably after it was designed because it was mounted right next to the sink. Ooh. And my daughter was washing her hands. I started to dry my hands, and it started to rain in the room because the water, the air went down into the sink, kicked all the water up what? into the sky. The water was all over the floor and the, and the toilet. So these things, you got to think before you use them. Wait, wait, wait. So it, it hit the sink water, not at the hand water. No, yeah. The, the air went right down into the sink, and it just caused all the water to gush up back on the other side of the sink. Whoa. And then fall the off water over, from over the, us. The, wow. And, yeah, it was wow. quite wet. That's well, terrible. you're going to enjoy this study then. Um, there's multiple studies that have come out and said um, that use of hand dryers spreads bacterial load in a bathroom more so than any other method. I believe it. The la- the one that came out last year, might have been 18 months ago, was actually funded by the paper towel industry, so a lot of people just ignored it. But there was a new study out that came out uh, last week that uh, they did uh, an analysis of the potential pathogenic bacteria in a public restroom, mm-hmm. colonized it if you didn't use a hair dry- uh, hand dryer at all, then colonize, uh, you know, collected colonies based on if a hand dryer is actually in operation and measured the difference. So under normal circumstances, they're seeing about on a normal PG dish, about one to two colonies grow just in the bathroom just because. Uh, under the hair, the hand dryer, I can't stop calling it hair dryer. Under the hand dryer, it was growing about 16 to 20 colonies. Ooh. Uh, and then if they installed a HEPA filter in the hand dryer, it reduced it about fourfold. Wait a minute. That implies that the bacteria is coming out of the hand dryer. Yeah, that's what the indications are, is that the hand dryer is either doing two, one of two things. One <laughs> is that it's blowing the air that contains uh, this bacteria uh, around the room or that it's generating sort of a, a air current within the room that yeah. is spreading this, this load. The situation you just described is a perfect example of this Mm -hmm. because the water you wash off your hands should have some stuff on it and that stuff is getting spread through the air more likely so all of that being said i still prefer the dyson thing but you put your hands in it yeah but you're not touching anything yeah you're not supposed to but it's like a operation i don't yeah i'm good at it what about what about the blade one that like goes sideways yeah, like that, the, that's the, the one that the did V. That's the one that did it to me. Oh, really? Yeah, the v? that was high power. Uh, yeah, I don't like the V. I'm still not a fan of the paper towel. You like Just, the uh, well? None of us talked about the the t- the worst idea, which the is towel. The, the, the towel, actual towel. The towel that goes in a circle. <laughs> no one likes that. No. No, because it's always wet. It's gross. It's right. super gross. Well, I I hope this doesn't just push people to paper towels, but think before you. Hand dry. Watch out for those poo particles. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. How many pathogenic bacteria are on a trade show VR headset? Um, <laughs> which part? The nose? Yeah. The nose the part? Nose bridge? part. Nose part's probably a lot. <laughs> That's probably the worst. Those LBEs are dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, you need gaskets everywhere. Hey, a uh, bunch of stuff uh, in VR. So last week on Friday uh, with our episode of Projections, which, hey, hit Google Trending, um, we had a preview of new Oculus Studios game, Defector. And Jeremy, you and I went to a preview event where we got to try uh, part of a level of Defector, uh, the same one everyone's played. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's by the makers of Wilson's Heart. You remember that one? I do. I remember being excited about Wilson's Heart and then playing it. I don't know. I played Wilson's Heart. Excited. It was what I expected from it. It was interesting. They it, went, it had a good mood. They and tried good. to do a Twilight Zone kind of thing with it, mm-hmm. which I don't think I, th- I think was successful. Long form story based VR game, but it was very teleportation based, like yes. node based. Yes, yes. 
Uh, this is almost the complete opposite. While it is still a narratively driven, you know, long AAA game, five hours or so with some replayability, uh, this is more inspired by action adventures, heist films. Uh, they say it's like Born Identity combined with Fast and Furious. Nick, I think it's more Mission Impossible. Sure, Mission Impossible I think works well too. Yeah, you're doing kind of crazy stunts. Um, and free locomotion, just walking around, wandering around. There's actually a lot of options, like more options than I'm used to seeing in a, yeah. in a game where you can tr- dial in whatever kind of control you want. I'm a, The biggest thing that I seen, I think it's a trend in locomotion, free locomotion mechanics, is head to pointed direction. I don't, don't care for it. You don't like really? it. Really? I know you do, and so did the, the producer of the game. He might no, let's like explain it. how it works. The CEO, right? but sure. So typically, like in a game like Rec Room, um, you, you either physically turn around and then move in that direction uh, and, or teleport, or you rotate using like your thumbsticks or touchpad. Yeah. Right. Uh, here, you are moving using your thumbsticks or touchpad to go forward. But what forward is, isn't where your body necessarily is looking. It's where your head is looking. Yeah. So, so you to use me your that head as a rotation mechanism while your j- sticks are using, uh, or your sticks are essentially the uh, lateral movement. Th- th- I mean, that's unnatural for me because I don't always look where I'm walking. That's mouse look, though. I look around. It is mouse look. But this is one of the benefits of VR is that we can evolve from mouse look. Yeah. And so I can walk in a direction and look in a different direction. So I prefer weapon-based controls, uh, whichever direction my weapons are facing. That's Ah. the direction that I'm walking. Interesting. Mm. Uh, So so your thumbsticks are still lateral movement. Yeah. But you're pointing the direction. And you have two hands, so it would be the hand that your weapon is in. Yeah. Interesting, because that's your intention, right? Your subtle intention Perhaps. is with your hand. But that means you can't fire in one direction and and, ru- and strafe. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess there are still limitations. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not um, a perfect system. You know what's interesting is that uh, I'm really comfortable in both 180-degree VR, like the Oculus Rift standard two-camera setup, or room scale where I can turn in any direction. I'm very comfortable. I can adapt to either one. Um, and in fact, sometimes even when I, I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm so comfortable with 180 that I, sometimes I wish games just supported that even in room scale. I brought my 11 year old, uh, who's so used to playing on the, the Vive. I, I let him play on the Rift and he was completely unable, Tangled. unable to stand, to face forward. I think that this is one of the things that we take for granted about be, you know, having so much experience is that, uh, if you, re- if you jump into VR for the first time, uh, yeah. It, Vive might actually be more intuitive because you don't have to manage that forward-facing. Well, also aspect. wireless is going to be a big deal. Wireless will be huge, absolutely. Uh, but for the game itself, um, what'd you think? Right, <laughs> back to the topic at hand. Um, it, you know, it's highly action-packed. Uh, there's some interesting branching that they're doing. I'm not totally sold that the branching is worth the effort. Because there, there are these branches that you take, and you either have the fight scene or you jump out of the plane. You, you experience one of these two things. And that's, that's interesting from a gameplay standpoint, but it also you're sacrificing dev time on something that you didn't get to see. I'm not convinced that's not the better decision. Maybe they should just go all in on make a, a longer l- game. linear experience or make it longer. So I, it's just adding a, replayability, though. So yeah, you're yeah. Saying the, Absolutely. No, that's, that's the trade-off. You get that. So but you're saying it's a cheat for replayability. I probably won't replay it. I don't have that time. So I personally, I would rather have a well-tailored linear experience. I mean, not only is it the branching that's supposed to enable replayability, but also all like the subquests, you know, like all the, the, the Easter eggy things yeah. you can do. So assuming the player is going to go back and try to get all the Easter eggy things, because it's VR and there's a lot of options, um, having a second branching option, you know, you're going to play a second time, might as well do a second option. That's true. That's true. So who's to say this is not the right decision? So, but it's just my little concern. But mm-hmm. it's a good-looking game. They've accomplished a lot since they started on this, which they started just after Wilson's Heart came out. Yeah, uh, they're saying four or five-hour game experience. Um, it's it's neat. There's a there's an interesting balance of stealthy, you know, uh, secret agent missions, but balanced with you know hi- high action mm-hmm. and fisticuffs. Uh, biggest VR hardware story this week. Finally, it's made. I don't know why it took this long after the reviews, but we have the stereo cameras on the Vive Pro working in SDK. Th- I did not hear about this. What? Nope. Vive works SR works SDK. Um, so with the stereo cameras, you can get uh, depth mapping, spatial mapping. 
You can place virtual objects in the foreground or the background, or you can get live interactions with virtual objects and simple hand interactions. There are some videos that show capture from the headset. The camera's qualities look like, you know, as we saw in the review using just one of them, wide angle, low res cameras, but you could place, it's mixed reality. You could place virtual objects in the real world. You could have portals. It's casting shadows on the real world of the, from these virtual objects. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe that's not accurate. I mean, no, it, looks it can, you can, because that's interesting, and man. if you watch one of the videos, you can see that the mapping it does, the real-time spatial scan is uh, similar to Dude, the mesh a, uh, built in um, uh, uh, Windows Mixed Reality. This is a cool occlusion it's doing here. Yeah, it's hiding behind the, the chalkboard. I want to see this. Can yeah. we use this? Uh, we can definitely try. I mean, are these, can you compile these SDKs? Are there executables that Vive Pro owners can download right now? Um, I think you have to get, uh, to, 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 you have to, uh, developers, if you, you might have to sign up for a developer account. Okay. Well, it'll be out soon enough. Yeah. But I think it's neat. Definitely. Now, the problem is that it's a low-res camera. Ah, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the problem. So, you know, that's that's limiting. It. You're not going to actually be using games in this mode. Um, but it is neat. It is a totally neat idea. Um, other news. Uh, oh, this is kind of cool. At NAB, NAB uh, National Association of Broadcasters, big NAB convention, um, the JPEG organization uh -huh. has uh, announced a new type of JPEG, JPEG XS. Oh, that's catchy. Now, JPEG stands for, of course. A JPEG motion group? No. Uh, joint, <laughs> joint photographic <laughs> experts. No, nope, something yeah, Joint Photographic Experts Group. Oh, right, right. MPEG JPEG. is the motion. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they say that with this new compression algorithm, that you'll be able to stream files, um, HD files on large displays, and potentially use it for VR purposes, and also okay. drones and self-driving cars. Cool. The uh, the guys who are doing the, the wireless solution for Vive, they said that their compression, their internal proprietary compression was grid-based, which mm -hmm. sounds like JPEG. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. Maybe they're related. Yep. So it's open source and also has HDR built in. So uh, once hardware gets uh, gets the right um, updates to start supporting this, um, we may get better, better, uh, lower bandwidth required for transmission. I mean, I, I, streaming. I, it's a hard topic because it gets really down to the bolts, but I, I would be curious to know, like, how is compression advancing? Is it due to more computational abilities, or are they actually coming up with more ingenious methods of compressing? I'm sure machine learning helps. Yeah. Right? You put a lot of local, 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 local databasing stuff. Uh -huh. um, you know. And what are the breakthroughs, though? I mean, is it, is, are, are they breakthroughs that are enabled by faster tech, or are they intellectual computational breakthroughs? I don't know. Um, and then something that may help in the avatar creation aspect of VR. Uh, this is something interesting. A uh, a 3D model that can be generated from about a person with a video. And it's just a front-facing video. So imagine, like, the camera that's in this room. You mean one camera. One camera. Yeah. If we just stood in front of it and did a little twirl with mm -hmm. our arms extended. Yep. Uh, this system that researchers developed was able to use artificial intelligence to map specific locations on our on our body and then generate an avatar from that just from us turning around using so, bones and joints exactly so but, it's a rigged model not not just a, a bad photogrammetry model that's right and they claim the accuracy is down to five millimeters uh which is pretty precise on some of the the location details and they released a video of what it looks like and while the avatars aren't doing you know you know, intensive movements, it looks pretty good. Yeah, it's fine. This does not surprise me, though. No, it's not surprising, but we haven't seen this yet. We haven't? Okay. I don't think so. Right. Just from a single camera on the front? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's definitely cool. It's definitely cool. It's a nice application. Um, I wish they could get better texture mapping. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I feel the like that. the camera. But I feel like, yeah, that's just a camera technology. Yeah situation see i think the limitation is when you have to have multiple rigs together um and you get that weird photogrammetry stitching together yeah, effects yeah, yeah. uh this takes takes out a lot of that so th i mean there's no reason this couldn't be done using a phone that's right i mean i i'm assuming that the resolution is an issue with the phone uh or potentially the processing power but there's well, no reason could, the video be can't be taken with the phone it yeah. could be cloud-based yeah, yeah exactly yeah you know, 
And that does it for the VR Minute and most of our podcasts this week. Shall we jump to our very, very last segment? What we've Testing tested? this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Can I talk about the NeuroSky? You can. MindWave? Sure. So there's a company that um, makes this chip, essentially, that's in a lot of products. It was in this the, a couple toys, one of them being uh, the, I want to say MindWave. Um, there's all the Force Trainer toys yes. where, where you oh, can yeah. control a ball that levitates in the old one. And yep. the, uh, apparently the new one has this supposedly holographic display that if you concentrate on it, it changes the, the images. Well, I've been I've been experimenting with this, where y you uh, you wear it on your headset. It has a little probe that goes right here on your forehead, and another clip that goes on your earlobe, and it will detect your EEG read, uh, rating readings, and it will deliver to you a meditation value, and an attention value. Oh, okay. And, and you're supposed to. I don't even know what the purpose of this thing is. I'm using it for an unannounced thing that I can't talk about, but I am I'm trying to hack into it, and there are people who have done this. A lot of people have done this. Yeah, where they can hook it up to an Arduino, Arduino and get these readings. Um, and it, it's definitely interesting uh, to be able to get any kind of re reading from my brain from a couple different points. So let's talk about some of the failures of this device. It uses galvanic skin response, uh -huh. which is notoriously unreliable unless you can consistently put the device in the same location on you at the same time and your sweat tends to interfere with this as yeah. well. Mm. So it, well, it, it tends to be unreliable in the long term. Having dry skin apparently is a problem too. So you have yeah. to find that half a <laughs> medium. Yeah, ex exactly. So because you need some conductance uh, occurring. I've seen it, um, a friend of mine used one to hack it together to control um, music playlists in an art installation. What? So you could change the color of a art design based off of your mood. Interesting. But it, it, it takes an exceptional amount of personal training to dial that in. Okay, I can see that because in my experience, it's all over the map. I mean, yeah. I can focus on something and I see the, the value go up, but then it starts to go down unexplainedly. And it, maybe it's because I'm now thinking about the fact that I'm looking at the graph. Or I, I don't know. I don't know. It, I, I think you will eventually get the hang of it with more yeah. time, like how you can control it. But it's, it's hyper non-intuitive for another user to come on board and cre yeah. recreate the, those same effects. It ships with a bunch of really crappy Flash games because the thing came mm -hmm. out like five or six years ago. But the coolest one is... Um, Fireworks, it's the most immediate response is fireworks, where it, the fireworks go higher the more attention you give it or the more meditation you do. I don't forget, one of the two. But you then explode the fireworks yourself by blinking. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the the data that you get does not have a clear you just blinked signal. So as, from a mm -hmm. hacking standpoint, you have to like compare two of the EEG values in order mm -hmm. to deduce whether or not there was a blink but you only get a new value every second, so I'm not sure exactly how you're supposed to do that. It's pretty low refresh rate. Yeah. One's a second. I, the two best games I played with it, one was another real world application where there was a rig that was hooked up to, uh, there was a balloon hooked up to a helium tank, or just maybe an air compressor, and you would have to relax, and that would blow up the balloon until it explode, exploded, and there was four of you competing <laughs> against each other to try to relax to get this thing to explode. That's interesting. And that was fun because it was it was a really simple kind of reading that that instrument can do. And then I played an actual video game that was sort of like this tank game that mm -hmm. you could only shoot by focusing your mind on shooting. Sounds mm -hmm. good? No. Oh. Um, <laughs> because it just didn't respond consistently. There's a new So a lot of people would be like, shoot, damn it, shoot, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it wouldn't do anything. There's a newer one called the Muse. Which is two hundred and fifty dollars compared yeah. to seventy dollars, and so it hasn't has, worked. It has great. a lot more probes. Yeah, but you're saying it's just as accurate, or just as inaccurate, in a lot just of ways. as unintuitive. Yeah. Well, it, it's just like when anytime you get a controller that isn't consistent person to person. Yeah, I I find that very frustrating. Mm -hmm. What would could, would it be better if we could attach to our actual brains? <laughs> Something be, invasive. That's on you, because man. I understand that the signal is much stronger there. Yeah, I do. It's, it's kind of where all the yeah. signal is. Yeah. Oh, Alrighty. I oh. added something to the set. Yes. 
Oh, let's talk about this. All right. Why wasn't this in pop culture? You are the one that has it. Well, Thanos can be looking for you. Well. Oh, wow. Whoa, they lit up. That's pretty good. Those LEDs? Well, well, this is the fake one. So as Hella would say, fake. Um, fake. This is the Hasbro toy um, that has oh. the articulating hands. Oh. For those <laughs> listening to individual the fingers. audio podcast. It also allows you to lock. This is Thanos' glove. Oh, yeah. His I'm holding an Infinity Gauntlet. Um, and uh, I think overall it looks really good. It has good heft. And, Norm, you can try out the puppeting feature. I would feature. love to try oh out God. the puppet. So – Left hand only. They left hand, of course. Do a right hand. And uh, the puppeting, it basically has these pulleys up above a bar that your fingers slot into, including your thumb. You might want to look in there. Oh, you got it. You got it. And um, I actually, I, I was very skeptical of the articulation uh, in a lot of the unboxing videos, but it actually feels really good. The only thing that is really terrible about this glove we all hear is it. that we cannot turn off the sound. You cannot turn <laughs> off the sound, and the sound is awful. Um, yeah, hardcore. The gems look okay. I think they look a little cheap, they're but fine. the shaping of the gems looks good. I just think there needed to be a little more light diffusion from the from the LED that's inside. So I'm going to take this apart. It's very um, easy to take apart. You can see where yeah. all the screws are. Yeah, I'm going to take it apart. Not be. I like the puppeting mechanism. I'm going to keep that in, in place. But I, I think I'm going to try to repaint this and potentially um, cha- well unplug the sound and then uh, change up some of the uh, information on uh, the way the gems look. Wow, it's a good size. You know, I suggested to Kishore. Kishore was walking me through all of these gems. And, yeah. and with Infinity War coming out next weekend, I think next week on the show... Kishore does a little recap, State of the Avengers Union, okay, so that we find out where are we right now with yeah. the, with the gems. Let's what go are, back to all eighteen movies. Back we, to one. What are we looking forward to here next week? Is the first movie Iron Man or Incredible Hulk? Iron Man. Oh, it's not Incredible Hulk. Yeah, That's so not canon. It's, sa- it's the same Hulk though. Yeah, fine. Good for him. <laughs> uh, I am struggling with one thing uh, on my real gauntlet. I mentioned this to a few people online last night. I've been trying. I've I've now cracked multiple gems as I've been trying to polish them with a Dremel, and I have to find like the right bit. But I've also been trying to do it where a magnet, when it touches the glove, actually does the conductance to do the electrical light up. It's not working for me. I'm a little frustrated. Hmm. Got to work on that. Well, that does it this week for This Is Only a Test. Uh, we have an outro from one of the you listeners out there. We do. We do from Kresmir Valjak. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Squirrel farts are the worst. I bet squirrels like them, though. <laughs> All right, we got to do this. We got to do this. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't touch them yet. Don't touch my Umibo. Oh so my God. if you're watching the video, if you're not watching the video, uh, I suggest you watch. jump to the video. Go, go to the YouTube page. Click on the video. Jump to the end. This is the last couple minutes. Uh, I have brought in my new favorite Japanese snack, Umibo. Now, I discovered this. Yeah. I, I learned about this. It's not anything new. It's been around for a long, long time. But I learned about this by, uh, by ordering something on eBay. It came from Japan, and it, two sticks were included in there. And I'm, what are these sticks? Opened up, took the gamble, took a bite. They it's are quite del- a they're, gamble. They're a uh, small puffed cylindrical corn. Think of them as big Cheetos, Japanese Cheetos. And they're a uh, retail price of 10 yen each, about 10 cents each. On Amazon, I have bought a bag of a hundred of them. The size of the Infinity Gauntlet. Yep, yep. Was this $10? Uh, it was like $20. Oh, my gosh. I paid above market price. Right. Prime? Yes, <laughs> Prime. <laughs> and there are 11 flavors, I, although I only found 10, 10 sticks so far. Uh, now, some they're savory. Most of them are savory. So know what you're getting into. They're mostly like, you know, sweet savory. This is not not a salty can. Uh, not not, not like a... You know, it's it's not candy. It's think of it like a Cheeto. Mm-hmm. Um, now there are many flavors circulating in Japan, including cheese, teriyaki, salami, chicken curry, tonkatsu, shrimp and mayo, takoyaki, beef tongue. This pizza. is making this much worse. 
I have no idea what these flavors are. There are a few of them that have English on them. Like the one does say teriyaki, but I want to do some taste testing. Okay, which one would you like first? We're gonna. I need you to be in with this. In, yeah, I'm, in I'm gonna on eat this them. with me. That's fine. All right, let's let's start with the far the far right. Far right. Let's do that one. Okay, describe the package. Uh, it's green. Okay, and it has uh, two characters on it. Nothing English by any anything I can see. The mascot is Doramon. I don't know what that is. Um, actually, the mascot is Umemon. You want me to break this into three? Break, let's break. Uh, Jeremy has to get in on this too. Oh no, <laughs> they they fall apart very. Easy. There you go, great. I will get one directly. That's you. That's yours. Piece. That's your piece, Jeremy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the broken part. Oh yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. Did you say what flavor this is? We don't know. I don't know. We're it's trying to figure Japanese. this out. Oh my god. Oh my god. This the car- the cat is wearing uh, some type of pink pajamas. It's, it's a fine. green package. And here we go. It's fine. I don't have a strong reaction to it. This one's just kind of okay. It smells s- much worse than it is. It's salty sweet. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-hmm. No idea. No. Okay, Cheeto. It, it, consistency of a Cheeto. Mm-hmm. Can I keep going? Keep on going. So the next one. Next one is good until July 18th of this year. Oh, good. I got, I'm going to th- finish these well before then. Um, my, my... I think that one's vegetable salad. That's what I'm thinking. The green vegetable salad. This one says salad. the word teriyaki. Why would you get it? vegetable salad flavor? I, I, I had a variety pack. Mm. No, oh this must be terrible. God, this is horrible. Mm-hmm. These smells. Okay. That has like a teriyaki flavor. Oh, a little, little bit. bit. I've never gotten such di- a very processed teriyaki dissonance flavor. Dissonance between smell and taste. Because it tastes so good. Completely different. It tastes so good. No, no. Let's let's jump to the, the one in the middle. There's that one um, that says corn. Corn. Corn there it patagi goes. is what Port- it says. Portagi. So they're, they're all the same. Donut. It's just different. Just different salts. Different powder. Different powder. Flavor powders. Okay. That's how they, they're 10 cents each. <laughs> this is by far from the ones I've I tried three at home. This is yeah. by far my favorite. How many pathogenic bacteria are on these? I don't know. It's, None. It's, because there's so many uh, preservatives <laughs> on it that none can live on it. Now this one. Isn't that good? <laughs> it's, it's a little like sour cream and chivy. Yeah. All right, this is the first one that passes. Is I would eat, I would eat this if I was starving. Mm-hmm. That one's okay. It has a cream corn taste to it. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Cream corn. Cream corn. That's, that's what it is. That's the most amazing scientifically generated cream corn taste. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Cream corn in a Cheeto. I don't love this. One more. All right. Uh, dealer's choice. Right in the middle. How do they do that, man? This one just says "bon" on it in exclamation points. So I don't know what to expect. This is why we're saving this for fake outtakes because nothing more exciting than listening to people eat crackly, crumbly yeah, things. Yeah, send that one to Norm. All right, I'm sending you smaller Thank pieces. You. This one doesn't have any. This bomb. There's no mm. hole in the donut. Oh, whoa! It's different. It's solid. It's... What? You didn't like this one? Not much going on oh, here. Oh God! It's much more subtle. What is that? A little cookie-ish. <sighs> Cheese? Maybe cheese? This is cheese flavor. Not much happening on that one. Yeah, cheesy. I don't know, man. I feel like our bodies are digesting this thanks to our ancestors. Cream corn. Cream corn Cream is corn's still the winner. Is still the winner. We'll go for one more. No, All right. No. That's this one more. one more. One more. One more, guys. Let's live in there. You my bow. If you find yourself in Japan or late night on Amazon... They just threw two of these in there in your random eBay Jerry, package? You, you yeah. Take it and break it off for. No, oh, I have to break this? Oh, God. Uh. <laughs> Thanks for taking a bigger piece. You want to sniff? What did this one say on the package? This is the orange package. Nothing. Nothing in English. This is a little more like a standard cheetah. Really? They all taste different. I just can't identify what the flavors are. No. Except for the corn one. Yep. All right, thank you, Norm. All right. Next week, I'll bring in a random food I got off of Amazon myself. How about that? All right. I prefer Steve Lin's gifts from Japan. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you next week. Bye.